I'm David Bevan. I'm your host. I want to introduce you to which computer am I using? I've got too many. The other people that are joining you today. So we've got Stavros Angelis from Maynooth, Catherine Cassidy. Uh, I don't think it's going to be appearing in person today. Mary Chester Cadwell. Mary, give us a wave. Anna Maria Sachani will join us online. David Kelly online as well. And Ariana, who is double, double duty today, is over there. So we're going to have lots of thoughts and ideas from yourselves. We're going to try and form some kind of sense out of them and get you to sense check that, and then we'll move on. So this is about setting the priorities for what we do. So I'm going to invite Mary up here next to tell you a bit more about the organization and the special interest group, or the SIG, and then we'll do the audience interactive bit, and that'll be the fun bit. Okay, so Mary, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm actually only going to speak really quite briefly because it is an audience-led panel, and actually, we want to hear from you and not from me. Um, but we thought it might be helpful just to have a bit of context about what any of this means. It's a very long word. Uh, the UK Island Digital Humanities Association is actually a fairly recent invention. It had its launch event early this year. And the idea for the community interest group which sits within the association is very specifically about bringing RSEs and RSE adjacent people together, those who work in arts and humanities. It um, came out of discussions uh, held by the steering group in the AHRC Infrastructure for Digital Innovation and Curation in Arts and Humanities, Phew. Um, which was co-facilitated by Anna Maria Sashani, who is joining us today remotely, and also James Smithies. And in fact, it was very much the brainchild, the driving force behind this community interest group is Anna Maria. So hopefully we'll hear from her later on. So in the RSC world, we are always talking about how important the intersection is between research and technology. Um, how increasingly key it is for research in general, and that is no different for arts and humanities as it is for sciences and other disciplines. Digital humanities in particular is highly dis interdisciplinary, and many of the projects involve computi computationally intensive research. So this is very relevant. People in arts and humanities with technical, technically focused roles exist. Hello, I am one of them. Uh, we exist. Hey, welcome. <laughs> um, so like RSEs everywhere, we sometimes work alone and sometimes we work in teams. Frequently, we have very specific domain knowledge perhaps from our own uh, backgrounds before becoming RSE type people. And we are key to high quality research and impact in arts and humanities as just like any other subject. We need these skills, we need to develop these skills, and we need to train and recruit people who have these skills. Um, and this need is really only going to grow. Certainly in my experience, um, there are not enough people to keep up with all the requests that we get from academics. Ariana was just mentioning that there isn't enough capacity in King's Digital Lab to do everything that comes into them either. So we need more people. So who is this community interest group actually for? So what we aim to do is really facilitate exactly this kind of focused discussion that we are hoping to have today, because we want to exchange knowledge, we want to exchange expertise, we want it to be grassroots, and we want to turn our thoughts into action, because we want to make a difference to policy from the grassroots. The AHRC, which is the Arts and Humanities Research Council, does a very important job in having those high level discussions that set the tone. But actually we need to make sure that the people who are on the coalface as it were, also have their voices heard and their issues are also uh, being driven. So it really made sense for us therefore to join up the RSE Society Conference where there are many RSEs with the Digital Humanities Association and currently, there really isn't a lot of overlap between the people who would attend this conference and the people who might attend a DH Association conference, uh, or indeed might consider themselves to be part of both communities. I do, but I'm probably in the minority at the moment. But this is a, an area for huge growth in the future if everyone comes to realize that actually we have a lot in common. 
So that's why we're here today talking to you about a community interest group for a different association. So uh, if you would like to additionally join the community interest group, we do have a Slack, which I'm sure you'll be thrilled to add to your plethora of Slacks that you have to scroll down every morning. Um, if you join our Slack channel, then you are de facto part of the community interest group. We also have a slightly sparsely populated GitHub repo, but hopefully the whole point is that it will become populated as people are active in the community. Um, finally, let us talk about what we're actually doing today, which is um, we're trying to do an audience-led panel. We want to make sure, as I said, that the voices from the grassroots are heard, which is why we're having this discussion. We want the outcome of this panel to be uh, a consensus on priorities for the community. It's just one of the discussions that we hope to facilitate. And to really get a sense of what actions we might want to take forward to make things happen. Um, as with all sessions at the conference, we will be using Slido, as Dave has already mentioned. Um, and we'll be, we'll be asking some questions, we will be discussing the responses, so please do upvote the ones that you think are most relevant. And afterwards we intend to go through all the responses and prioritise them. So I think what we're going to do before we do that is we're going to just take any general questions that people might have about the community interest group or any other questions arising from what I've spoken about. Um, yeah. I am happy to host this one, Mary. You were steering the slide up. Uh, we do have some questions. Um, some of these look like they might nice a segue from the previous session. So uh, I'll take a couple of questions here, but we might have to wipe this and move on a little bit. Um, top question here. The KDL document is a great resource for large embedded RSE groups. Does a similar resource exist or is there interest in creating one for solo or small teams? I would love to put that to the audience, but I can't because uh, of the technology. So I would like you to be able to tell us. Um, people on the panel, uh, Ariana, do you have any further comment to, to give? Maybe one thing to say is that because we, we this this template has been available only recently, one thing that we could do maybe is publicizing a bit more within the the RSC group that for which we really have representative for and see whether it could be adapted or it might be that people tell us, oh, you forgot about this very important thing that we do and it's not even in your list. Um, so maybe, or, or for smaller team to say, actually out of these 20 things, we can do only these two or we do well only these two, I don't know. So it could be maybe something to put to the community to test. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, we have some things that we would like to go through. What, panel people, what do you reckon? Shall we go through the slide? Because questions are coming in. We had We had a little agenda set, but I think as an audience led panel we should just go with the questions as they flow in so should we do that okay so approximately 15 years ago it would have been rare for biologists to have coding skills but today it's rare for them not to have basic python or r or sql git etc do you see the same transition happening to a and h researchers or is their appetite for more collaborating with rse stroke data scientists now i'll let you two have a think before that i think we should introduce our remote panelists can we press some buttons and bring in Two people in the center screen, everybody wish. Cross your fingers. Hello. Hello, Anna Maria. Do you want to quickly introduce yourself? You've got 30 seconds or so. It would be lovely to see you. Cool. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna Maria Sihani. Um, I'm one of the coordinators of this community interest group. Um, I, um, as Mary uh, said, I originally had this idea of uh, setting up a kind of um, task force uh, within the IDA, uh, the AHRC uh, scheme for uh, Arts and Humanities, Digital Infrastructure and Innovation. And that was the starting point of, you know, discussing the necessity of having a, a, a focus uh, community interest group. And uh, here we are today discussing about goals, priorities and um, next actions. Um, over to David. Thank you, Anna Maria. And David, can we beam you in from the Emerald Isle? Speak uh, now. Sure. Good morning. Um, I'm David Kelly. I'm Digital Humanities Manager in the University of Galway, which is in the west of Ireland. Um, I was at the first RSE conference back in 2016, and it's nice to be back, if only remotely. 
Um, so yeah, I work with with on digital projects with researchers from across arts and humanities, and I'm a new addition to the this community interest group. Um, so yeah, I, I'm really here to learn from the the RSE community and you know the 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 kind of strength of of connections that you've developed over the last um, eight to ten years, I suppose. Thank you for those intros. I'm not expecting anybody else to be remote, but if you are appear now that's a good sign okay we've not been hacked great okay so the question was i'll reiterate and i'll maybe phrase it my way um other disciplines perhaps have embraced computational methods coding for a long period of time and have transitioned or transitioned into that is it still is that same transition happening to arts and humanities research is the appetite for collaborating with RSEs and data science in all technical aspects? Yeah. Anybody want to answer that panel, people? If nobody else wants, I can say something. But Go ahead, Ariana. Um, so I definitely think there has been a shift, even if maybe the curve is not as, uh, as uh, increasing as quickly. And most recently, probably the biggest shift has been chat GTP. So a lot of uh, literary scholars, um, also historians, but in general, humanities scholars have become a bit more interesting, interested um, in experimenting with some of this technology or in understanding it a bit more, if anything, because it's, be, it's become very relevant for their teaching. So I think that in terms, especially of language models, that might we, we might um, see an important shift coming and in fact it would be absurd in my opinion if arts humanity scholars were not involved in this big hype around um artificial intelligence and language models that's definitely the biggest one but i think in general also the the availability of data collections that are relevant for especially cultural heritage arts humanity is much bigger than it used to be so the uptake is i think it is increasing at different pace but maybe you have other other impressions and other opinions Mary, do you, do you want? Yeah, to I would here? say that I've been. We've been seeing in Cambridge an uptick in both of these. So more people getting excited about, um, you know, uh, large language models and other things that they're seeing, um, coming and saying, "I need a, I need want to work with a computer scientist or somebody who understands this stuff because I don't, but it sounds really exciting." So definitely lots of that. But also, I do quite a bit of teaching, and we definitely have. Um, postdocs and career academics who do a bit of coding um, who are looking to upskill as well. So I would say that both of those are actually increasing. It's not one or the other. Fantastic. I think I'll move on to another question. I'll quickly say it's perfectly okay in arts and humanities for research to be non-computational, right? And the solo research still takes place. So any idea to sort of convert everybody into computational methods, not going to work. But there's amazing opportunity there okay so this next question i might turn to our remote panelists to mull over and work out whether you want to answer first i can't see you unless you speak so if you do want to answer this one say something otherwise i'll pick on those in the room question from giles here anyone had any luck with outreach to humanities from general rse teams so they go on to say, we've had some large projects, but also some academics who declare, quote, it's all beyond me, and quote, I couldn't possibly. Um, what, one of the reasons I was interested in the community interest group was that in Ireland, we don't have a well-established um, infrastructure of general RSE teams. Um, so RSEs aren't commonly found in Irish universities, in, in my experience. I, I, I'm open to, to correction, but I, I haven't bumped into many. Um, and that was one of my reasons for, for joining or for being interested in this community group was to, to make those connections. Um, so no, I haven't had any look, any look to answer Giles's question. Yeah, if I can uh, quickly add, I think that, um, I mean, I don't want to uh, comment on a personal experience, but what what's my feeling is, is that we have we notice this, um, you know, this new tendency coming also from budding, from funding bodies. So we see that there is a lot of uh, uh, funding research uh, specifically uh, for um, computational um, 
and data-driven research in arts and humanities. So we see that there is a lot of interest from funding bodies like the AHRC, for example, also Welcome Collection or um, other funding bodies like the British Academy. Um, so um, the more the funding uh, bodies uh, react positively to this type of projects, I think the more kind of pressure we have as a community, you know, to to create or to invent uh, new um, working um, workflows, uh, new teams, uh, new skill sets and new workflows within our existing um, humanities uh, environment. So I think that um, this is a kind of uh, an evolving uh, and uh, growing interest uh, within the community and within the, the field. Um, and uh, of course, they, I think that you, you you can also comment on this from your experience in the Turing, um, you know, that there is a growing interest uh, in this sort of uh, research. That was very slick. That's my opportunity to add to this. Thank you. Um, and yes, in the Turing, we're in a very privileged situation being a national centre for data science and AI, and I think people will tend to come to us. I see a hand up in the audience. We're not allowed to take verbal questions. It's all got to be via Slido. I'm sorry to say to give both our remote and in-person um, people the same, exactly the same opportunities to engage. Um, I please accept that. Um, anybody else from here, or shall I move on? I was just going to say one one small thing for those teams that are generalists and they wish to engage in arts humanities subjects. Do touch base also with those teams that work in arts humanities like us, because we might help, or we might be able to provide examples that you can then bring to your researchers as things that could be done in their subject areas. Um, I think that closeness to the research domain it, it is imp more important for areas that maybe are more emerging in terms of using computational methods. Um, so, yeah, I think hopefully this community's interest group will help in that sense as well. It will, it will. I'm looking for consensus, and I'm, unfortunately I can only have consensus in the room, but with your permission, can I can I wipe the Slido? Because we've got some questions for you. Like, we want to know who's in the room, what brought you here, what priorities you see. So can I begin to steer the questions that you're answering? Would you like, are you happy for me to do that? Stick your hand up. And the other option shortly will be, do you want to keep on asking us open questions? Stick your hand up now. I'm sure I saw the same hand twice. Maybe I didn't. <laughs> I need some consensus. Right. Option A, and I, we should do this via Slido, is... <laughs> Say again. We can do a poll. We can do a poll. Okay. Okay. Right. Here we go. Poll time. Let's do everything by slide. Well, option number one. We can, you can, we can find out who's in the room, perhaps ask you your experiences. Who are you? What institutions are you coming from? Things like what priorities you want to see from a community interest group. Option number one is that sort of agenda, community based. Option number two, we treat it like a panel session and keep on firing us amazing questions and we'll do our very best to answer them, but you might not get to chip in nearly as much. Okay, option A, we'll try and let you lead the agenda in that sense, questions asking of each other. Oh, it's coming in, here comes the results, here we go, here we go, here we go. Who was in the room is winning. Oh, carry on with Q&A is catching up. Carry on with Q&A. When, when I said audience interaction, I don't think any of us thought it was gonna be this. Okay, 10 seconds. Whoa, 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 no, no, no. Who did that? <laughs> I'm just going to stay here until it changes. Right, okay, over. <laughs> Everyone with Q&A wins. All right, superb. Thank you very much. Uh, this is not what the abstract said. So thank you for changing. This is community-led. Okay, back to the Q&A session. Give us your give us your nice kind questions okay we we we, we want to engage okay so next question and we'll start off in the room and then we'll come remote what would arts and humanities researchers want rse oh the question just changed who did that i didn't do that oh did i already ask that right okay now on to a new one oh, i think we've had this one too oh uh, i don't think we did answer that one about what do we want 
arts and humanities people to learn. Sorry. Okay. Uh, but we haven't had this one. Okay. James's question. Physical sciences have a history of infrastructure investment. Digital Humanities RSE seems to be making great progress. Do you and researchers you work with have some specific digital infrastructure needs? And is there sufficient investment from organizations and funders? Oh, I like that question. I want to answer this one, but I will give the panel first dibs. Um, in person first, and then we'll go to David and Anna Maria. You go, I talked a lot. So. Okay, well, David and Anna Maria, either of you want to take this? Particularly from the Irish context, perhaps, David. Um, <clears throat> do we have, yeah, did, it's specific digital infrastructure needs. That, that There aren't specific funding calls that have come through the Irish Research Council for infrastructure-related projects, as far as I know. Um, I think DARIA, the, the European, um, God, I can't remember what it stands for. <laughs> um, somebody in the room might might help. Um, that That is a, a, an infrastructure project that supports kind of uh, DH research. Um, but there's nothing that's funded nationally as far as I know. Thanks. From my perspective, I've been involved in some efforts in the UK scene, and I like to think the news is a bit rosier. So UKRI, and there was a speaker from UKRI yesterday or the day before, was really talking about digital research infrastructure investment, and all the research councils are coming together. So Arts and Humanities does have specific needs, and we do have some really, really interesting technical case studies. So our data tends to be uh, large. It tends to be perhaps digitized, so it's data sets that have been digitized from physical records or qualitative um, sensing or the data, and it tends to span many, many decades. So we have particular requests. Our research tends to be that of very iterative processes, so with the human in the loop. So a bit of research, you get closer to your problem, you can you can begin to express it in a new computational way, you do a bit more research, you begin to hone in on it. So it is is it's that loop. So coming back to the question, yes, I think we're going to see some pilot investment in this sphere. And particularly if you don't, you know, digital research infrastructure is high performance compute and storage, and that's fine. Those are shared tasks across many, many disciplines, but you need the people to drive it. You need the skills. And that's where it is very, very specific to different disciplines. And in the past, we've seen big national investments, HPC, and a lot of their training is targeted at particular disciplines. And um, people from arts and humanities might come along and they just don't know how to engage. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not open and that dialogue, just the way things are described are not good. So I think we're gonna see a greater investment and one that will face different disciplines. And it's for us, that work in the arts and humanities to really give those complex use cases for those investments. So if we don't use it, it will get taken away from us. Can I just quickly add on this? Um, it, so just a comment on the uh, current in infrastructure investment from a AHRC. So this, uh, the IDA program, the infrastructure for digital innovation and curation in arts and humanities is exactly uh, focused on this area. So. As you mentioned, um, there was uh, the first round uh, funded uh, uh, 11 um, um, small scale research projects, actually scoping grants on um, repositories and data services for um, arts and humanities data. And there is now the second round of funding uh, specifically focused for training um, training skills uh, for arts and humanities on how to use um, existing and future uh, infrastructure uh, for arts and humanities data. Uh, it's a large funding project. And as you mentioned, you know, there is uh, also HPC in the program. Um, so there is other areas of investment. And there is also the room for us to imagine and comment and ask for a specific um, and uh, RSC uh, funding, uh, if that's what we want from uh, AHRC. Thank you. And Anna Maria, the, the, there's a 
fantastic report, I think, which has come out fairly recently that might outline some of these investments. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, we can uh, we can share the link. I will add it in the uh, um, in the room. In the do, do you want to share with us what the title is? I'm, I'm being well. You're being coy. Yeah, it's a uh, it's actually a white paper. <laughs> uh, it's a white paper about the um, 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 infrastructure for digital innovation and curation in the arts and humanities research software engineering um, needs. Actually, uh, you can find uh, the um, uh, the second version of this as a working paper uh, in Zenodo. Uh, let me find the exact title. Sorry, <laughs> I'm unprepared for this. <laughs> um, Sorry, that's so, my fault for putting you on the spot. No worries. It's IDA Research Software Engineering Steering Group Working Paper. Under this uh, title, you can find it in Zenodo. Let me also try and... Um, post a link uh, or a citation for you. Okay, we'll pass that on. I'm going to move on to the next question and I'm going to look to the tech team. So the next question is this, what would Arts and Humanities researchers want RSEs, not from Arts and Humanities, to understand about their work? Now that's what I'd love to ask all of you. Can we somehow keep all the Slido questions, put them to one side, and then ask everybody that? Can we do that? James, here we go. We're really making all the conference organizers sweat today i'm sorry panel people what categories might we seed this q a poll with this is a i think a tricky one because i mean think about it if you ask the same so what a what a, a generalist rsc that doesn't know anything about physics would need to know about physics to collaborate with a physicist right <laughs> there's a lot of stuff potentially um so i think it depends if one one might think in terms of types of publications, for example, that might be, um, so for example, a type of publication that it's quite common in some humanities discipline are editions or scholarly works. So understanding that kind of structure of publication is something that is quite relevant for- so Should we have output types? Could output that be, types maybe, that could, maybe be it. Yeah. could we even see this with- and I'm going to archive all of the questions. Oh. They should be restorable. Okay, okay, okay. So we can have some open responses yeah, other than closed questions. Exchange. Okay, yeah. thank data you so much. This might be another type of data. Yeah. I think authorship norms um, vary across all sorts of different disciplines and particularly in arts and humanities where monograph can still be a big, big thing, right? And that isn't unique to arts and humanities, but it certainly is a defining factor. All right, and I will ask any of the panel members, I'll give you about five seconds to shout out online as well if there's anything you want to engage with here. Otherwise, we're just going to zoom through your, your thoughts, okay? You're the community. These are the things that are important to you. So first up, what both sides might mean by data. Oh, good one. Yeah, what is data? Um, panel members, any experiences of data? There is a whole um, theory, theoretical uh, debate around uh, data and capta in which humanities isn't there. So this idea that uh, if you use the Latin word data is something that it's given, right? Capta is something that it's constructed. So the 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 whole idea behind of these interpretative disciplines is data are in themselves no neutral, and you put a lot of bias into creating data. A lot of uh, decisions are in there, and selections and so on. So I think that's a really interesting area of work for RACs in um, in that space. Very good. And of course, in arts and humanities, you can still spend a whole day discussing whether data should be used plural or singular. <laughs> Types of outputs. Now, I would love to see in this next ref exercise software coming from arts and humanities departments. I haven't seen it in the previous one. I don't know if anybody has, but that's my personal wish. Anybody got any thoughts on types of output? I'll come to remote people first. Anybody in the room? You don't have to answer. We're going to zoom through these otherwise. Nope. Good. Okay. Um, what both sides mean by workflows, RSE processes and humanities scholars way of working. Yeah. Yeah. So humanities methods don't always map onto digital methods. That's a very good point. Okay, um, mixed methods. Shall we take that as the same? Maybe I saw that and I 
write those two into the same answer. Okay, Sherman, setting clear objectives and paths. Sherman, you've worked on a project alongside me. Is this feedback you're giving me? <laughs> this is not the right venue. Uh, <laughs> No, but it is actually. Uh, sometimes some of us can get carried away with high complexity models for simple questions. Yeah, okay, so no when enough is enough. Um, yeah, that's a good answer. Yeah, Thanks. okay. Thanks. Good, I'm just, I just want to go back to mixed methods to just explain one thing that just came to my mind while looking at that. Um, so there's something that in, in, in arts and humanities research called distant reading, which is essentially an application of text mining, but a lot of people use it to inform their close reading, by which I mean they do a whole bunch of text mining, they find out some interesting stuff, and then they go and closely read the results. They re closely read the original texts and use their, uh, their humanities expertise to understand better and in, in more detail the source data. So it's not necessarily that they want a whole bunch of statistics at the end of their text mining. What they might want is a way in so that in into a lot, very large volume of data um, that they can then apply their traditional methods to. So I would just say that about mixed methods. Yeah, everybody wins. Okay, can we bring up the next one? So skip that one and Sherman's we've had. Okay, that they're open to using tech to enable their work, but don't always know how to communicate their technical needs. Oh, 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 I feel there's a story behind whoever wrote that one. There, there is a story behind that, but yes, you know, there can really be a barrier. Has anybody got in the panel some stories like this or, or maybe tips to sort of break down those barriers and, and get that communication working nicely? Because we all work with different researchers, different connections. Definitely. Well, one thing I can definitely say that for KDL has become very, very important is this role of the analyst um, as a kind of uh, facilitation role between the technical expertise and the humanities or humanities scholar who might be more or less digitally literate. Um, and the idea there is that the analyst plays this role of a back and forth in a way. Did I understand correctly you mean this? And this do, do we agree that this means that? Or so kind of rephrasing some of the objectives or some of the research context, some of the what are the units of analysis, and then translating some of those together. Obviously, it's a collaborative effort into requirements. Um, obviously, there's a lot of challenges, it doesn't always work, but we definitely put a lot of effort into defining the skills of that role um, and ideally being a role that enables both ends. So on one end, the resource software engineer, developer, designer that is working on the data themselves and developing specific um, uh, back end or front end um, resources and so on. And on the other hand, the, the different types of humanity scholars we interact with. Um, so that has been very useful for us. So that I would say is the main tip I could give. And then maybe one additional thing is uh, prioritization. So there are very good practices in the RSC world around prioritizing minimal viable product ideas or restricting the space where you're working as you go along in iterative um, ways. Um, something that at the beginning, maybe some researcher might push back against, but then they actually find very useful in also focusing um, the work. So then that's my main. Thank you. Anybody else on that one? Super. I'm going to take this last one as a comment, and then I think we'll bring back our previous list. So we went on a little detail, but this last comment was, I really wish that people understood how arts and humanities research works better so that we could talk more about what computational technologies facilitate it better than others. And that warms my heart. So that's you saying, okay, I really want to make it better. Let's do that. Thank you for this little detail. Um, shall we go back to the original open list? We can do that. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And then we'll, we'll take off where we left. Apologies if we didn't get around to your question. I took everything that I had at least two thumbs up. What, in your opinion, do computational methods specifically offer to the humanities? Any projects you particularly like or projects you like? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I'm going to start with David. Computational methods and projects you can compare, uh, you particularly like, David. Putting me on the spot with projects I've worked on. <laughs> um, what, what do computational methods I su offer, I suppose, a different perspective than humanities researchers might be used to. Um, so it gives 
it can offer a different perspective on the data that they have or you know the, the content that they're engaging with and any projects I, I particularly like. Um, I, I worked on uh, a European Research Council funded um, project a couple of years ago called Research, um, which was looking at the reception, reception and circulation of um, women's writing, early, early modern women's writing. And that's a good example of a team of researchers using um, in that case, it was it was network analysis to to engage with content and a, a data set in in a different way than they would have been able to do had they not used computational methods. I suppose. I think I'm going to turn to everybody on this one. So, uh, if I may have Anna Maria's thoughts on this. Yes. Um, so I'm not going to uh, describe a project that most probably you, Dave, are going to describe, and this is the Living With Emma Sins. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just going to, uh, for example, mention uh, the the big AHRC uh, tank program, which is towards a national collection, which is, um, I, I mean, from, from my perspective, it's in the borderline between arts and humanities and also another field we haven't really mentioned it, which is cultural heritage, which is heritage science, for example, that is, you know, in the bigger scene of arts uh, and humanities. And um, so this program has a number of uh, uh, foundational and now we are in the phase of discovery projects. Uh, where um, we can see uh, projects from um, crowdsourcing uh, and community-based history to um, muse large-scale museum collections uh, uh, using uh, advanced AI or machine learning techniques uh, to, um, um, let's say, ensure better connection between the collections or uh, advanced linking or um, advanced processing of the data uh, and access to the data in new uh, uh, ways. So uh, this is one of the kind of programs with uh, 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 various projects that I think uh, it's an exemplar um, arts and humanities projects with a strong computational um, uh, angle. Thank you so much. Um, Ariana, and then I'll turn to Mary after Ariana. Um, yeah, I was go just going to say in general, I think that the, the, the projects can vary a lot and the methods can vary a lot. But personally, if I think of the ones that are more satisfactory, actually are projects that have been quite quick and small. Um, for example, we had a couple of years back an historian that was already collecting data with a student uh, in archives all over, well, it's mainly it was France and, and, and some archivals in, in archives in Egypt and other areas in Africa about migration in the Ottoman Empire between France and, and Africa. Uh, so what we did with him was a little bit of that research service catalog work. So we sat with him and look at the type of the way that he was collecting data and we suggested some way of improving that structure. Um, and then we use, with a very, very small amount of funding, we use some existing tools for mapping some of that information. So when I say mapping, I mean geographically mapping. Um, with tools that we knew were following already best practices in terms of RSC and required quite a minimal customization. Um, and immediately the complexity of the data could be seen and emerge from this work. And then you could then use that to as a pilot to kind of uh, probe uh, new funding. So it was a very quick... A couple of months work together but it immediately and this person had never this history had never worked with RACs before but it immediately revealed the 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 potential of working together both in enhancing the data set that he already had and improving its structure the data model behind it but also indeed in using tools that in this case weren't even particularly sophisticated but obviously were robust enough um, to then take it to a, even to a level of output, public output as a data visualization that was interesting enough for him to do further interpretative work and get the funding. So this is a very small example, but I think it's that kind of area where you could really make a difference and an impact also in researchers that potentially haven't worked as much um, with data. Um, so I was thinking of two particular types of things that I've worked on recently, which uh, blend uh, computer vision and machine learning. 
Um, both of them were projects or are projects that work on um, large collections that the University Library, where I work in Cambridge, um, have in their collections. They've been digitized by the Digital Content Unit, so we have images for all of these uh, um, volumes or, or, or um, pages. So one is using um, machine learning and, com and computer vision to automatically recognize handwriting. Um, and in particular, I'm thinking of um, a project called Curious Cures, which looks at recipes that are written in medieval manuscripts and using the Transcribus platform, which is a way of, um, uh, is, a, is a wonderful uh, platform for automatically recognizing the handwriting and transcribing it um, so that then the scholars can correct and then use that um, text. So that's one example. Another example is a project about Spanish chapbooks, which is a kind of ephemeral street literature that was popular a couple of hundred years ago. Um, there's a big collection in the British Library and also in Cambridge University Library, and they are brought together in the Cambridge Digital Library. And we used um, a piece of software from Oxford um, called uh, Vise or Vise, which is the uh, it's a visual search engine. So these particular uh, types of material have prints made from woodblocks and these woodblocks were used by publishers over a period of years and decades and they were reused in multiple publications and these were publications that were kind of stories and um, titillating reports of like murders and things like that and so we were able to um, use the search engine to find all of the different uh, prints that were made by the same woodblocks so that we could use that to improve the dating of the material. So if you imagine a kind of time series of the woodblocks used over time and then to incorporate that with existing metadata. So those are two examples. There is, we have so much material and it would be so great to be able to do these exciting methods on more stuff. Um, yeah, there you go. Thank you, Mary. We've probably got about four minutes left. So what I'm suggesting we do, can we wipe the Q&A? And then my question to you lot is, community interest group, France Humanities, just give us a yes in the Slido if you think this is for you, whether you're going to join right now or join later. And regardless of whether you want to say yes or not, don't, don't say no to us. That's just mm -hmm. not nice. So say yes or nothing. Or give us your priorities. What should this interest group do for yourselves or your colleagues that work in this area? I'll give you about a minute or so to think about that. But please come in through the slider. Give us your thoughts. Help us shape what should represent you. We can have a book club. Would you like a Zotero resource list instead of keep it electronic? We can do that too. David, just saw a comment in the previous that uh, maybe it's useful to mention. Somebody mentioned the DH Tech group of Haro that uh, is an interest group um, of RSEs in the humanities. And yes, we're connected to them with them. Um, some of them obviously based in the UK are also part of the community's interest group. So yes, we know about them. They had a really great panel at this Haro conference this year. That's really great news. Uh, and we should thank Anna Maria, who also has her very young assistant who has a conference appearance, presumably before the age of one as well. We've seen there. So that's good. Um, keep the slide away coming in. There we go. Hello. Thank you for joining us. You have your hands full. Oh, an exclamation mark. Thank you, exclamation mark person. Okay. I think it's time to begin to draw this to a conclusion. Thank you all. Thank you all for keeping us on our toes and keeping the tech crew and keeping the conference organizers on our toes as well. I hope we've been able to deliver something somewhat interactive. Um, it might not be quite how we'd all like it, but it has been really, really useful to have you in the room, have you challenging us. And, and you know, well, half of the questions we wanted to ask you, I think you came up with yourselves. So it just really leaves me to thank all of our participants. So Anna Maria Sajani, who you just saw a minute ago, Anna, give us a wave. You might have to turn your camera on if you're there. If you're not, thank you. David Kelly, so there's Anna Maria. Thank you. David Kelly, thank you very much for joining us as well. You thank might you. need to say something so you appear and, and then we can give you a wave. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ariana Jula, thank you, who has done an hour and a half's worth of work. <laughs> so when you do applaud her, give her a double clapping. Oh. And Mary. 
Chester Cadwell. I've got it the right way around. <laughs> I have been David Bevan as well. And so thank you very much. Please talk to us afterwards. Join the interest group. Show your love and passion for arts and humanities and spread the word. Thank you very much.